three, three, there will be three speakers who will speak for 15 to 20 minutes each, and then we will have a panel discussion. Our three speakers are Dr. Anirudh Rajput, who is a member of the International Law Commission at the United Nations. He plays a very important role in terms of understanding the interplay between international tax disputes and bilateral investment treaties. And more importantly, the Indian legal system, how it is intertwined. Thereafter, we will have Ms. Anuradha Dutt, managing partner and senior partner at DMD Advocates, the person who is responsible for taking or steering Vodafone through the dispute for over a decade. She's very well known in the legal fraternity as one of the most sought after lawyer for civil disputes, tax disputes, and has experience of over three decades in the area of disputes and arbitration practice. Thereafter, we will have Mr. Arvind Datta, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. He doesn't need any introduction. He has overseen disputes in the area of constitutional law, direct taxes, indirect taxes, company law, so on and so forth. So without much ado, we will have these three speakers speak first. Thereafter, we are going to have two more panelists join us. And those panelists are Dr. Blazis Kuzniaki. He is a deputy director with Pricewaterhouse Polish practice to look after tax disputes and strategic tax advice. And Dr. RJR Kasi Bhatla, who is a deputy legal advisor to the Indian Ministry of Law and Justice. We will also have Honorable Justice A.K. Patnayak join us to deliver the epilogue. I will reserve the comment insofar as the large introductions are concerned. And without much ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Anirudh Rajput. Uh, we welcome you, sir, to take us over to your keynote address. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bhutani. <clears throat> Let me begin by thanking the International Fiscal Association, all its office bearers, you, Mr. Bhutani in particular, and and, and young and dynamic uh, Ms. Shita Farsaya, who probably was instrumental in, in, in getting me involved in this uh, end. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be a part of this distinguished panel who are not only good about the theory of the law, but have seen the functioning of the law in close quarters. My task today in the next 15 to 20 minutes is try to set the scene of how the regime of investment treaty arbitration functions and how and to what extent it overlaps with international tax law. And then I'm sure the other speakers will speak to more specific instance that we all are here to discuss and contemplate about. I wish to begin by saying that the way in which public international law has been transformed by investment treaty arbitration is simply phenomenal. I say that because if we were having this conversation, say around 25 years back, prior to the accidental emergence of investment arbitration, because investment arbitration emerged actually as an accident when not many people knew how to invoke these investment treaties. Until that point, it was always fairly understood that matters of fiscal administration, particularly tax, and other broader issues of monetary policy were exclusively within the domain of states. Those were sovereign prerogatives, and these prerogatives were not to be touched. The regime of protection of individuals prior to the coming of the BITs or prior to the regime of investment treaty arbitration was, was under the domain of, as we understood, as customary international law. Customary international law provided limited rights to individuals, and those light rights were dependent upon their home state, that is the state to which they belonged, invoking those rights on behalf of them. In fact, this theory comes from classical Roman law. The idea was a Roman citizen can roam around the world without fear of anybody, 
because if anybody touches him or her, the whole Roman Empire would come to his or her rescue. Likewise, but at that stage, it was often the arm of states, it's the force of states which is used to protect its own individuals. But what the bilateral investment treaties do is two states enter into a treaty with each other. And through that treaty, they make a promise to each other that they're going to protect the interests of investors who invest from one state into another state. So the interesting part is that the promise is not made by the state to the investor, but a promise is made by the state to another state that it is going to protect the investor who comes from the other state. And this promise, which is in the nature of a state to state promise, is often construed and now has been pretty much construed mostly by domestic courts and even in, in academic writings as a situation where there is a standing offer to arbitrate. Now, the great difference which these investment treaties has brought about is in the past, there were several such treaties which did try to protect these rights of individuals, the most prominent ones being the Friendship, Commerce and Navigation Treaties. But none of these treaties provided for a direct dispute resolution mechanism. And that is the revolution which has come about. In the past, if a foreign investor was mistreated, the only option the foreign investor had was to go back to his home state and request his home state to take up the cause on his behalf with another state which has committed some form of a wrong against his or her property, which was classically understood as rights of aliens. But what investment treaty arbitration did was it removed this political angle and said, the moment states enter into a BIT, a bilateral investment treaty with each other, they make a standing offer that is a readiness and willingness to go for arbitration whenever an individual of the other state feels aggrieved by any of the actions of the host state. Now, the interesting part here is that the term actions of a host state is quite a broad phenomenon. What we can often un is technically understand it is in the nature of public actions or sovereign actions. Any act which a state undertakes in performance of its sovereign function is therefore amenable to a challenge by an individual, either a corporate or a private individual, of another state if certain of the contents of that bilateral investment treaty in question have been violated. Now, this is an interesting part because classically in international law, for a long time, it was understood that sovereign act actions cannot be challenged by individuals. But bilateral investment treaties, for the first time, give an opportunity to an investor to challenge sovereign actions. Now, these sovereign actions can take a wide variety of forms. The two awards that would be discussed today relate primarily to taxing powers. But we should not get the feeling that the rights are that that investors can challenge only taxing powers. Investors can challenge a broad range of powers, which includes the right of taxation. Now, the right of taxation is itself a, a precarious area and quite an interesting area, which has developed quite interestingly over the years. The way tax lawyers understand international taxation is quite different the way in which a traditional public international lawyer would understand its interaction with investment treaty arbitration. So until prior to the development of investment treaty arbitration, there was an understanding that this is a, a different a set of different laws altogether which function differently. But what has happened by virtue of investment arbitration, because there is a possibility of challenging sovereign action, even the taxing power by itself is now amenable to challenge. Although traditionally under international law, the understanding was that a, that, a, that a taxing power of a state would not be challenged. For example, if one looks at the, at the Harvard Draft Convention, which was the first effort at, at codification of customary international law, specifically excludes taxation from, uh, from the purview of challenge by aliens. So is the situation that in the third American restatement, which is also a statement of customary international law. But this customary international law, as I said, 
has transformed because investors get a right to file a case by themselves without having to go to their own state and initiate arbitration proceedings. Now, the basis on which, which these arbitration proceedings can be commenced is quite important to understand. And there are three phrases which often one comes across. One is a BIT, second an FTA, and third is a model BIT. There is a lot of debate which happens around the Indian model BIT. We need to understand, and there are model BITs of several countries. A model bilateral investment treaty is a non-binding instrument. It is only an offer, it is only a draft based on which a state wants to negotiate its bilateral investment treaty. It certainly represents how a state thinks about rights and obligations of investors, but a model bilateral investment treaty is simply a model, it is not a binding instrument. So our starting point ought to be either a bilateral investment treaty or a free trade agreement. As the name suggests, a bilateral investment treaty is a treaty which deals exclusively with issues of investment and normally entered between two states. A free trade agreement is quite distinct from a bilateral investment treaty in the sense that it has a broader scope. It is often in the nature of trade which involves several aspects of trade. For example, there would be issues of services, there would be issues of goods and many other things which states may want to negotiate. And from this broad array of subject matters which are covered, one of the areas that are covered is investment. So it's quite possible that these proceedings might be initiated under a free trade agreement or under a bilateral investment treaty. Well, if one looks at the substance of these two treaties, there tends to be quite a bit of difference because of the scope of activity which is governed by these two kinds of treaties. Now, having given this background that now taxing powers, which were otherwise not challengeable, now are now challengeable. But the question is, who can challenge it and on what grounds? The answer to the question, who, is often what is called a jurisdictional question. For a bilateral investment treaty to be invoked or a free trade agreement in, which has an investment chapter to be invoked, it is necessary that an international tribunal to whom an investor wishes to go has jurisdiction. As I made a point some time back, I need to re-emphasize it, that these investment treaties contain a dispute resolution clause, unlike the prior treaties which did not contain a dispute resolution clause. And this dispute resolution clause gives a right to an investor to file a case directly against the state concerned, against its actions, including taxing powers. But as I said, it may include several other powers, not just taxing powers. Now, who could be that investor? As I explained, these treaties are normally between two states. And it is a promise from, invest from, the, the, state, from the first state that whoever is the investor from the second state, I'm going to accord certain protection to the investor who comes from this second state. Now, in order to invoke, in order to be eligible to invoke a certain investment treaty, you need to have, the tribunal needs to find out whether the person is entitled. And that entitlement is often called the ratione personae jurisdiction. Ratione personae jurisdiction is whether the person is entitled to do it. And the fact of this entitlement arises from the fact of whether that investor be belongs to the, to the other state, apart from the state which it wants to challenge. So for example, there is a bilateral investment treaty between states A and B. Investors from state A can sue state B, but investors from state A cannot sue their own state. There always has to be a cross. Now the question is, when the investor from state A wishes to sue state B, the question is, who ought to be that investor? The question is fairly straightforward answer if that an investor in state A is an individual. We know we can look up his nationality. There are issues of dual nationality, but I won't get into it. What you might be interested more being tax lawyers is a corporate entity. And there's always a question of what is the nature of a corporate entity? Which would be the nationality? And the answer often comes from bilateral investment treaties. Until recently, most of the treaties used what was called the incorporation test. 
that is where was the company in company incorporated in fact the two awards that we are going to discuss today both are based on that kind of incorporation it doesn't matter where the investors are actually from all matters is where was the company incorporated so one might even say the case which is yet to be decided is vedanta who's probably has indian sources indian origin but is a company which is incorporated in the united kingdom and can sue india back in fact one of the first cases this issue was hotly contested was tokyo tokelis versus ukraine where the then uh, one of the arbitrators wrote a very severe dissent criticizing the majority but what the majority said was all that matters is where is the company incorporated because in that case the company had 9% shareholders from uk ukraine who were trying to sue ukraine back a treaty which through a company which they had inco- incorporated in another state but this is often called round tripping you incorporate a company somewhere else the shareholders are actually from from the home state but by sh- incorporating a company you try to sue your own state back this is quite rare but what often happens is because there is a labyrinth of these treaties there is a there is a broad arrangement of these bilateral investment treaties often called as spaghetti bowl they are so interlinked it is possible for states for 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 foreign investors for corporations to constitute themselves in one of the most convenient jurisdiction in order to avail most benefits of a given bit so there is a new area which is now developing and which is quite important i think which top tax lawyers would be interested in that as tax lawyers when you advise a corporate to have tax planning it is equally important to do a bilateral investment treaty plan especially because it's not just about india losing cases it's also about indian investors who need to be protected abroad and there are a lot more indian investors which are going out rapidly and investing abroad there are certain issues in some of the some 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 countries in asia africa and even in europe nowadays because regulatory measures are getting more stringent and contrary to interest of foreign investors matters is even today if there is even if there are no bilateral investment treaties because india has terminated its bilateral investment treaties even then an indian investor can sue a foreign state because it would sue that state from the place where it has incorporated itself so it's quite possible that an indian investor who is incorporated in mauritius can sue united kingdom under the uk mauritius bilateral investment treaty without even though technically the investor is an indian investor so we need to realize that there is this uh, layering and one can make use of this layering to decide which from which place which bit to be used to be sued to for which for which state moreover there is an additional question of which is the most convenient bilateral investment treaty because all these bilateral investment treaties are not similar their contents widely differ and because the contents widely differ especially the big multinational corporations try operate in such a manner that they can avail the benefit of the broadest bilateral investment treaty but while doing so it needs to be kept in mind and and the jurisprudence of investment tribunals is quite clear on this you can do it as a legitimate planning but you cannot constitute yourself after a dispute has arisen to avail the benefit of a bilateral investment treaty therefore if the incorporation was done much before the disputes arose it is quite possible then for 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 a foreign investor to sue a state by using different formulations of incorporation in different jurisdictions and what does come out as i think that's an interesting part which comes out from the crane award is that it it says in that was one of the india's argument that there wasn't a direct investment and it's a very settled position of law now even under exceed arbitration and and other arbitrations there is no need to uh, uh, to to have a direct investment there could be indirect investments and one can seek protection through them so that's an interesting part which in a sense opens up the possibility of multi for multinational corporation is to resort to different mechanisms in order to avail one of the most convenient most suitable bilateral investment treaty then there are requirements of jurisdiction such as ratio materia jurisdiction that is have you made an investment 
there are much more issues which I don't think I should get into. But these are issues of more of substance, of facts. You have to prove you have a presence, you've invested, and a host of other things. You might simply be a shareholder as well, which could also be an enough reason to show that you have an investment. There's one point which I want to make here, and that's where the Indian Model Bilateral Investment Treaty tries to avoid what is called the round tripping. That is the possibility of Indian investors suing Indian investors back again. In fact, it goes one step further from what the German Bilateral Investment Treaties used to do. The German Bilateral Investment, Investment Treaties used to use the test of seat social. That is, rather than looking at incorporation, look at where is the effective management? Where is the company effectively run from in order to identify its true character? The Indian Model Bilateral Investment Treaty goes a step further and says there should be an enterprise. There should be an actual presence and not just mere incorporation. So what will happen would really depend on which bilateral investment treaty you have under consideration, which state is ought to be sued, and which situation you are in. Then, as I said, you have to establish that there are substantive uh, investments which are made. Then let me briefly touch upon what are the treatment standards so that I don't go too much beyond my allotted time. There are several treatment standards, and these treatment standards would change from one treaty to another. But there are certain standard standards which are, which are normal and can be found in most of the bilateral investment treaties. The oldest standard of treatment, which comes historically, which came even before bilateral investment treaties existed, is of expropriation, what we classically understand as nationalization. We all know the famous bank nationalization case, which we all must have studied at some stage. Whenever a government takes over the property of a foreign investor, either directly or indirectly, or if the government simply takes measures which have the ultimate effect of deprivation of the foreign investor of his or her property, even without actually taking them, that would also amount to indirect expropriation. I, could only, I, I understand that it's only the dispositive, that is the final conclusions of the Oprah Award which are in public domain. But what I do see from there is the tribunal decided not to address the point of indirect expropriation. Because if you look at other cases, there are several, um, several cases where taxation issues were involved, where the investors argued that the taxation was such that you caused us a loss and you drove us out of the market. And therefore, you need to pay compensation because it is a breach of an indirect expropriation clause. There's another very interesting, interesting phenomenon of creeping expropriation. There may not be one tax, there may be several sets of tax. And that was the experience in Rosneft versus Russia and all those allied cases where Russian government took several measures over the years, taxation and others, in order to drive out the foreign investor. Such a measure could also be pretty much be challenged as indirect expropriation. The second prominent one, the most famous one, is called a fair and equitable treatment. Now, fair and equitable treatment has a very curious history. Uh, fair and equitable treatment is very bare. It doesn't have any content. But tribunals have said, despite it doesn't have content, we will import concepts from domestic administrative law in order to give content to it. And one of the major areas which came up is legitimate expectations. A legitimate expectation is if an investor enters a market, if he looks at the market, or mostly now the jurisprudence is constantly evolving, but where it stands today, it says, that if a state has made a certain promise, and I think that's where India could have had a better case in both these proceedings, because India never made an express promise, so there could not be a legitimate expectation. But well, what is what is gone is gone. We can't uh, we can't feel feel bad about it. But that's always has now been read into by most tri most uh, tri uh, tribunals to say that in order to have. Uh, have fair and equitable treatment violated, you need to have legitimate expectations, and legitimate expectations have to be based on concrete grounds, made on assurances direct, or which could be inferred from the circumstances. And there are several other aspects of, of fair and equitable treatment in the form of due process. You have to, you need not give a hearing all the time, but bare requirements of, of, of natural justice have to be complied with. You need not, you also have to be reasonable. You cannot be arbitrary. There has to be a rationale behind whatever measures you take. It's also one of the ways in which foreign investors can, can, can go to a tribunal and say that the governmental measure contravenes their fair, and, uh, their fair and equitable treatment standard expectations. And in practice, what we find is 
most of the of the cases where investors win, mostly they win on the fair and equitable treatment standard because it is the most easiest to meet. The other associated standard is the full protection and security standard. This is again a classically international law, classical international law standard. But this standard is more about physical protection rather than an assurance of due process, which is the hallmark of fair and equitable treatment. Although there are several tribunals which hold that fair and full protection and security is much broader, it also includes protection of the legal framework. But there's a large majority of tribunals who do not agree with this viewpoint. So it's equally important in these disputes who you appoint as an arbitrator because it's the arbitrator's orientation that is going to decide what is going to be the ultimate outcome of, this, of, of these disputes. The next standard after full protection and security, which is often prevalent, is the most favored nation treatment and the national treatment standard. And I think as tax lawyers, you all must have been exposed to this at several occasions. In simple words, national treatment is where uh, if a state discriminates between a national foreign investor and a foreign, and a foreign investor, then that would be a breach of its national treatment obligations. And most favored nation treatment standard would be breached if lesser treatment is given to one foreign investor as compared to some other foreign investor. There are several issues of most favored nation treatment clauses. In fact, most favored nation treatment clauses have been used to import better provisions from other bilateral investment treaties, which was done in, in the first case that India ever lost in white industries versus Australia. But that's a big topic, and I don't think uh, you all may be interested in how the substantive issues of uh, that importation through most favored nation treatment clause works. But apart from these standards, there can be several other smaller, there's often uh, arbitrary uh, unreasonableness standard, a state should not behave arbitrarily or unreasonably. There's also something called the umbrella clause. Now, umbrella clause is quite peculiar. I said before that under investment arbitration, you can only challenge sovereign actions. You cannot challenge contractual actions because contractual actions will contain their own dispute resolution clause. But some tribunals have used mostly, in, if you look at the early clauses in any bilateral investment treaties, it contains the provision of promise to give highest standards of protection. And this has, has been used to interpret to mean that contractual disputes can also be elevated to treaty disputes and can be brought before investment tribunals. But there again, there's a chasm, there's a cleavage, there's a difference of views between different tribunals. And all these standards, you you, all you have to do is basically win on one of these standards. You need not win on all of those standards. Even if you succeed on one of the standard, you have won the case for the foreign investor. And that's what has happened probably in both these awards, which would be discussed today. The tribunal didn't find the need to address other standards. What could a state do in these situations? A state might often raise a defense of regulatory freedom, saying that the measure I, I undertook was to protect my public in national interest and give sufficient reasons for that. And that's where the tricky question is, where do taxing powers reside? Is the matter of taxing power within the jurisdictional aspect or a substantive defense? In both these cases, India argued it as a jurisdictional aspect, saying these issues cannot arbitrate them outside the purview probably more to it to argue that it's also a substantive reservation. If one looks at the Indian model bilateral investment treaty, in particular paragraph 2 and 2.4, it excludes taxation from disputes, which means such taxation measures cannot be challenged because a tribunal would not have the competence to do that. Some Indian BITs, which are now lapsed, do that, but most of them don't do that. But if you look at that world over, they do include these provisions. But often in the indirect expropriation clause, while describing regulatory freedom, several bilateral investment treaties also contain a taxing exception. And whenever such a taxing exception is contained, it would be a substantive defense and not just a jurisdictional defense which would come before. So this is a broad journey of, of, of how investment uh, treaty arbitration functions. When can an investor file a case? On what basis? he or she can file a case. Now, the last point I think which I should make and stop because I'm probably going over my time is what is the relief that an investor can claim? This has been, this is now fairly settled in international law and particularly in investment arbitration disputes 
that the dispute would primarily be monetary in nature. In other cases, there is, was a possibility of restitution. That is, there would be some sort of an injunction. For example, at the World Trade Organization, the panels and the appellate body of the WTO issue injunctions saying government should remove the measure. So let us say if this was a dispute where, uh, and it's quite possible these disputes could be brought even at the WTO, but not by the investor, by the home state. That is, it's possible that United Kingdom might sue India saying your retrospective tax and improper tax. The consequence would be uh, the government of India would have been asked by the WTO to withdraw the tax and not to pay compensation. But investment committees don't do that because arbitrators and are, don't find themselves doing it. Rightly so, because this issue raises serious issues of legitimacy, problems for the system, because the system is already go, undergoing a lot of stress and strain. And the members want to be careful about the sense, sovereign sensitivities. So all they end up doing often is about avoiding compensation. So that's what something an, a foreign investor can look at. If you look at the whole scenario, it is transforming quite rapidly. It has transformed uh, over the years. And there's always a tough challenge for a state as well as, as foreign investors. And that's something which I think the government of India would be pondering quite deeply. On the one hand, where it is getting, getting sued by these foreign investors, it also needs to be careful that its own investors are being protected abroad. As I said, even though to, today Indian in treaties are terminated, nevertheless, Indian investors can resort to other investment treaties by, by smart restructuring. But if India also thinks of, of, a, of a more detailed policy of trying to balance out when and how to, to undertake these steps and when and how to allow structuring and restructuring, and what should be the policy in relation to states from where India is expecting investment and states where India wants to invest, that could also be something that the policymakers can reflect upon. I hope this was a, a not too de uh, was was a sufficiently detailed and sufficiently thought provoking uh, 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 tour of of what investment treaty arbitration is all about. I very much look forward to listening to other speakers and uh, any questions or comments that you have in in the course of these proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ra Dr. Rajput. Uh, I'm sure we will have uh, lots of questions. Uh, just for everyone's uh, benefit, uh, Dr. Rajput practiced in the Supreme Court of India and is currently practicing international law and arbitration in his capacity as a consultant with Peters LLP. His reference to Germany is very interesting because in 2017, he was practitioner in residence at KFG International Law, Rise or Decline in Berlin, Germany. More importantly, he was also a member of a study group constituted by the Law Commission of India in 2015 to look at the draft India model BIT, which is a subject matter of dispute as well. In the meantime, uh, I just thought I will uh, take the privilege to uh, welcome uh, Honorable Justice A.K. Patnayak. Uh, he is an Indian jurist and a former judge in the Supreme Court of India. He has practiced across various foras in Orissa and the Supreme Court of India and in Madhya Pradesh as well. He was appointed as the Chief Justice of Chhattisgarh in March 2005. Thereafter, he was with the Madhya Pradesh High Court. And in 2009, he was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. He served as the Chairman of the Committee on Constitutional Law and Allied Subjects for the project of the Indian Law Institute on reinstatement of Indian law. He has spent several landmark decisions on arbitration law, tax law, and constitutional law in his stint at the Supreme Court of India, wherein he retired on 2nd of June, 2014. He currently serves as an arbitrator on many, many important commercial arbitration. Uh, a warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. I know we have scheduled an epilogue to be delivered by you, but right now we will hand it over to Mr. Uh, Arvind Datta, a leading uh, jurist and prolific speaker on a host of issues, including commentary on the Constitution of India, guide to central excise and guide to excise procedures, Nani Palkiwala's famous courtroom genius, apart from several, several articles, and more importantly, recently, 
the general editor of Ramaya's Guide to the Companies Act and the 11th edition of Kanga and Palkiwala Law and Practice in India. So a very warm welcome to you and over to you. Uh, you've overseen the Kane Award and uh, we hand it over to you to explain to us as laymen what does it mean to us as tax practitioners. Yes. Uh, good evening and uh, good evening to all of you in India. Good afternoon to all of you in Europe. Uh, it's been a, I must thank uh, Mukesh Bhutani and the IFA for inviting me to speak on this uh, subject. We had uh, the Vodafone Award first and then the Kane Award. Uh, the Kane Award is more detailed, it is not just a summary. So once it gets into public domain, you'll know the reasons for it. Before I start, I must, uh, it's really a pleasure to be with all other panelists and particularly Justice uh, Patnaik. I, when you mentioned that he retired on 2nd June 2014, it's really difficult to believe that six years have passed since we used to see him regularly in the Supreme Court. Welcome, sir. And uh, what Mukesh, you forgot to mention one thing, that apart from being a Supreme Court judge, uh, Justice Patnaik is now the uh, editor of uh, G.P. Singh's Interpretation of Statute, which I think is one of the best commentaries on interpretation. And I think we couldn't have got a better person to take up the mantle of the great mantle of uh, Honorable Justice G.P. Singh, whose work is a really classic. So nice to be on the panel with all of you. Welcome. Uh, I must thank Dr. Rajput for giving a very, very detailed and a excellent presentation on an overview of the bilateral investment treaty ecosystem. As he rightly put it, uh, 25 years ago, I, I, I mean, the uh, BIT arbitration was something outside the legal solar system. I didn't even know what it meant. And ICSID and so on and so forth were complete, literally Latin and Greek to all of us. But over the years after White Industries, uh, the interest in this subject has developed. And now with these two major awards, it has become a very important topic for all of us to ponder. As a person who had the opportunity of appearing so keen, it's, i just uh, be brief because we're running over time. One was what was the prelude to these awards, both for Vodafone and Kane? Uh, what was the award per se? And this current dispute about the sovereign right to tax and BIT. So how do we reconcile all these problems? First of all, the prelude to the award was the entire proceeding started because of the Vodafone Amendment, what as popularly called the 2012 Finance Act. As all of you know, and Anuradha Dutt was mainly instrumental with Mr. Salve and so on for getting this decision on January 12, 2012, where the Supreme Court held that if the shares are owned by non-residents and they are transferred overseas, then even though the underlying assets may be in India, there is no transfer in India and no question of any capital gains arises in that particular transaction. Uh, they overruled the Bombay High Court. The Bombay High Court partly allowed the matter. They did hold that shares which are overseas are not Indian shares, but they said that part of the profits would be taxable in India. But the Supreme Court said, no, they said, you don't have to look through, you must only look at and so on and so forth, that she'll explain more in detail. Now, I was really hoping that this landmark decision by Honorable Justice Kapadia, Justice Radha Krishnan, and Justice Swatindra Kumar was an internationally sensational decision. And I think it portrayed India as a country where rule of law prevailed that it didn't really matter whether your investments were 40,000 crores or 500 crores, the law was the same. And I was worried that this important judgment would be overturned by a retrospective amendment because we did have a history of any important decision going in favor of the SSC being retrospectively amended, not only in uh, indirect taxes, but indirect taxes as well. So as bad luck would have it in the coming budget, there were a number of amendments and they went back, they were made with effect from 1 4 1962, particularly amendments to section 9 and section 195 of the Income Tax Act dealing with taxation of non residents. Once these uh, laws were retrospectively amendment, I mean, you can correctly characterize them as retroactive amendments and not just retrospective. It became clear that transactions made in 2006 for Kane and I think 2007 for Vodafone, which were not taxable at that point of time. And in Vodafone, up to the Supreme Court, it was held, it was not taxable. Suddenly became taxable in 2012. As far as Kane is concerned, we got the assessment in 2014, where retrospectively tax was levied. And what was also unfortunate was not only the tax was levied, but also 
it was interest and penalty. The transaction which was not taxable at all in 2006 suddenly became taxable in 2014 and it was subject to interest and penalty. Now, I'll come to the sovereign right of retrospective taxation. There is no dispute that India has a sovereign right to tax, but I'll come to that later. Now, as far as uh, Vodafone is concerned, they didn't have any assessment. They went right up to the Supreme Court and they succeeded. But as far as Kane is concerned, we have an assessment, we have an order, we have a order before the uh, an order of the tribunal, and now it's pending before the Delhi High Court on the merits of the matter. Separately, the Kane, as the claimant, invoked the arbitration clause under Article 9 of the India UK Treaty, which was signed in March 1994. And Article 9 actually contemplates an initial negotiation then a conciliation and then an arbitration. But I think I came in late on the scene, so I think they straight they went straight away for arbitration. As you know, the unfortunately India did not appoint the arbitrator immediately. So the president of the permanent court of arbitration at the Hague, they appointed Mr. Thomas for the Union of India. And we did have a wonderful panel of arbitrators. The, it was truly international. The chairman was a Swiss national, the one arbitrator was Bulgarian and the other was Canadian. And uh, those of you who will see the award later will notice that there's been a very, very nuanced and fine distinction on tax avoidance, on the merits of the Azadi Bacha Andolan, tax avoidance, tax evasion, the principles of rule of law and so on. Without going into great detail because of shortage of time, the claim was made that the retrospective taxation or the retroactive taxation Violated Article 3, violated Article 3, Clause 2, which says, which is what uh, Dr. Rajput said is the fair and equitable treatment clause. It's very simple. It simply says that the investment shall be treated fairly and equitably. They also questioned, uh, they also challenged it on the ground of violation of Article 5 because of that's the expropriation clause, because shares of cane were taken away and sold. And they also challenged on Article 7, that is the prevention of the investments going back freely. So these three challenges were made and ultimately were upheld and uh, damages of $1.2 billion were awarded. If I were asked to summarize the award in just few sentences, I would say that the tribunal held that retrospective taxation is directly a violation of Article 3 and violates the FET clause. It held that retrospective taxation violates the principle of legal certainty. There is a very good discussion on what is the meaning of rule of law in terms of the UN United Nations resolution, in terms of the Vienna Commission, and in terms of international law. What are the five or seven principles of the rule of law? And for our discussion, one important thing which the tribunal relied upon is legal certainty. They said that when you make an investment and you know that these transactions are not taxable as on the applicable date, then to tax them retrospectively would be violation of the rule of law. Significantly, the tribunal relied on Indian Supreme Court decisions to say that this is the law in India. In the Vodafone case, Para 91 says that legal certainty is a central pillar of the rule of law. And they quoted Justice Sikri in the Vatika Township case, who said that the law should be always prospective and not retrospective. And the essential principle of the rule of law is that law should not be retrospective. So ultimately, the award went against India, primarily, almost exclusively on the ground of the retrospective nature of the tax. And the tribunal notes that this is perhaps the first time that they had occasion to do retroactive taxation. There was a case against Jordan where there was a retrospective amendment on setting aside arbitration awards or arbitration agreements retrospectively. But the tribunal observes that this was perhaps the only case where there was retroactive taxation and it came up for the first time. I just mentioned one point, one interesting case which we relied on is the Paushaw versus Mongolia, which now I'll come to this aspect of sovereign right of taxation. Nobody disputes that there is a sovereign right of taxation. Every international tribunal has said that there is a sovereign right of taxation. And Blazes and I uh, were also will mention that there's an excellent article by Julian Chase, who has analyzed international arbitrations involving tax problems, tax disputes, international treaty arbitrations involving tax disputes. And the author sets out 32 
disputes. And it will be interesting to note that in 17 disputes, the state has succeeded. And in 15 disputes, the claimant or the associate has succeeded. So there is an even balance. So there is no, you can't say that the tribunals are biased, biased towards the, the SSEs and not towards the states and so on. The awards are. And if you see some of the uh, awards, particularly in the case of Russia and so on, the UCOS case and so on, the retrospective, the, I mean, the tax changes were quite egregious. Now, coming to the retrospective aspect, is that in Poshok versus Mongolia, there were a bunch of Russian investors in Mongolia. And Mongolia has large amount of gold reserves. The initial taxation, let's say, was X percent. And there was a sudden increase in gold prices, and they went up almost eight or even ten times the initial value when the investment was made. Now, Mongolia steeply increased the rate of tax. And the investors said that they invoked the clause and said that, look, we had a legitimate expectation that the tax would remain at a particular level. We never expected this kind of heavy taxation, and steep increase in tax is a violation of the FET clause. And in a very well reasoned order, Award. The tribunal said it is the sovereign right of tax. No investor can expect that the tax will continue to be the same for in the future. A country can raise the tax, but there's a nice observation they say. They simply say that different considerations would arise if the law was retrospective. So there are cases which say nobody disputes the sovereign right to tax. And I would only, in towards the close of my talk, I would only submit that in a bilateral treaty, or even in a multilateral treaty, in a bilateral treaty, when country A and country B agree on certain clauses, agree on FET, agree on expropriation, etc., and you'll find that most of the BIT, the clauses are quite, the same templates are there, the same clauses are there. Now, the same, the bilateral treaty is entered into by each country in the, in the, in excess of its sovereign power. Treaty making is part of the sovereign power of, us, of the union. That's what's recognized by our constitution as well. And it's my humble view that signing of a treaty and agreeing on certain limitations, agreeing that I will protect, I will ensure that the investment of the other, country, other investor is protected. I will ensure that there is fair and equitable treatment, that there's no expropriation this free movement of investments. This is a sovereign concession made. And every time you sign a treaty, it is my submission, and I would throw it for discussion as well, that signing of a treaty itself is a partial surrender of your sovereignty for mutual benefit. After all, if you see the treaty, what does it say? It is for promotion of investment, protection of investment, and fostering greater further investment. So you say that, look, you come to my country, make your investments. Whatever income you earn here will be taxed fairly inequitably. So this is the promise I make. And when people tell me about the sovereign tax in the context of the present case, I just ask them, just flip the case. Suppose a large industrial house of India had made investments in the United Kingdom, let us say in 2005. At that time, the UK laws did not tax those transactions. Now, what would you say if the United Kingdom, Her Majesty's Government of the United Kingdom, in 2015 or in 2020, came up and said that, look, your transactions in 2005 were not taxable, but it's my sovereign right and I will tax you in 2015 or 2020, retrospectively from 2005, collect the tax, collect the interest and collect the penalty for not paying the tax, which was not existed in the first place. I mean, ask a simple elementary common sense question. Could anybody say that this is fair and equitable? That's the question I put. And I just mentioned about the new investment treaty of 2016. The, in my view, this treaty may not uh, get universal acceptance or large global acceptance because of two limitations or two uh, impediments. One is the taxation clause. We have made it very clear that tax disputes will not be arbitrable. And the second uh, difficulty is the clause which says that exhaustion of remedies, that you can't go for international arbitration unless you exhaust all local remedies, which leads to a complication. Suppose I go up to the Supreme Court and I lose. Then if I go to the award and I succeed, which is going to prevail? Will the Supreme Court award judgment prevail or the award will prevail? 
or vice versa. Suppose I uh, win before the Supreme Court and lose before the, I mean, and if the U department goes to international arbitration, what happens? So it leads to so many complications. But I'm told that except Belize and a few countries, nobody has accepted, nobody has signed these awards. So it shows that the uh, non-inclusion of taxation will not be a, will, will be a huge uh, dampener on this treaty arbitrations going forward. And I personally feel I don't see what is the objection in including taxation. Why can't India say, yes, we want investments, we want to be a 5 trillion economy, we want to grow at 8% GDP. Why can't we say, yes, come to India. I assure you that your investments will be safe, they'll be protected, and we will not indulge in retrospective taxation or any kind of unfair taxation. What is the problem in saying that? So I just thank the... Uh, uh, and one more thing before I forget, one interesting point which the uh, tribunal makes is an excellent discussion on the concept of the international principles of the rule of law. And the seven pillars of the rule of law include uh, legal certainty, which is a very nice discussion. And I will just uh, conclude by saying that I hope uh, the uh, Mukesh mentioned what next. I think the lessons to be learned from this is that uh, before a law is passed, one has to have some kind of an impact assessment, at least a simulation study that if I pass this amendment, what will be the impact on international investments? What will be the consequence in a treaty? That is, has to be borne in mind. We can't just make a retrospective amendment. Perhaps nobody thought that this kind of arbitration will be, uh, clauses will be invoked, but this is a point. But one point is, in all fairness to the present government, there's been no major retrospective amendment. So to that extent, they've stuck to their promise. Uh, one is retrospective amendment will certainly create problems. Secondly, we should also know that it's not just taxation, as uh, Dr. Rajput mentioned. Even other laws which could impair investments could lead to arbitrations. And I would certainly hope that the government rethinks and includes taxation also in the investment treaty. We want more investments and we should have investments which are on par with most of the other countries in the world. If you have to be, we are now already the fifth largest economy. I think we should think and behave like a dynamic and growing economy and not worry about taxation. And what bothers me is that very often we just think of the income tax we're going to lose or what is the taxation we're going to lose. We don't think about the overall consequences, what the Supreme Court called the overall burden or the overall benefit theory. That by allowing these investments, we may give up some taxation, some taxes, but what is the overall benefit to the economy is what we should keep in mind. Thank you so much to the organizers. And I look forward to listening to all of the other speakers as well. Thank you, Mokesh. Thank you, Mr. Datar. Uh, before I hand it over uh, to Ms. Anuradha Bhatt, um, Ms. Anuradha Bhatt uh, to take her, take us through the Vodafone, uh, uh, you know, saga, if I may say so, uh, uh, but more importantly, the conviction that she had to invoke the bilateral investment treaty uh, and not opting out for challenging the uh, retrospective amendment. Just very briefly about her, she is uh, earned her LLM from the Columbia University uh, and after graduating from the New Delhi Law Faculty, she is amongst the most sharp after lawyer with significant experience in civil, commercial, corporate litigation. She has extensive experience on international arbitration, particularly in relation to the BITs and has also handled complex matters across multiple jurisdictions in the UK, United States, Singapore, Europe, in host of factors. She also sits on the boards of many, many Indian companies. Uh, personally, uh, Anu, I'm delighted to welcome you because I know it's not easy to get you other than on the television, but uh, welcome to uh, the EFA platform. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mukesh. And uh, I can assure you, if you had not reached out, I may not have accepted. So uh, <laughs> thanks. and. Uh, Thanks to IFA India chapter of thinking of me. Uh, I was involved uh, in Vodafone case from, I think, 2008 or so. And, uh, you know, when we succeeded in Supreme Court, we really believed that a transaction that was held, concluded outside India, money paid outside India, no presence in India is not taxable. And for the first time, and it's not that, you know, such transactions hadn't taken place 
but probably the the money the quantum involved opened uh, you know the tax office eyes i, I don't blame them but uh, that's how it was and when we succeeded we were so elated that you know the advice given by tax lawyers by us you know proved to be right but i still remember in march when the budget came uh it was in the fine print it was not in the budget speech i didn't sleep the whole night i felt like i used to say like ben johnson you know who ran the race in olympics in 1988 or 89 and he was given the gold medal and then it was taken away from him because of some drug charge drug abuse charge so i really felt like that uh but you know i as you are aware the award the proceedings the challenge these are confidential unlike uh, kane award which has come in the public domain for a phone is confidential so i can't really talk about the award but i would like to say a few things including on uh, sovereign sovereign power so to say of the state to tax uh first thing uh, that you asked me how is it that vodafone decided not to challenge in india but uh, invoke the bilateral investment treaty between netherlands and uh, india so it was a tough decision but when we you know when we saw the retrospective amendment taking us back to 1962 and that too to a closed transaction you know the supreme court said that this is a policy decision if you want to tax where the effect is in india or where the control changes to tax but in future and government then you know takes a volte face and uh, goes and reopens our closed transaction where the entire money uh, consideration had been given to uh, hutchison and hutchison surprisingly government of india never went after him at that time so we had two thought processes one was you have to know that vodafone doesn't have any indian shareholder so to go and challenge under the constitution article 19 is ruled out and most of the judgments are under article 19 that is freedom of uh, to carry on business that's where most uh, challenges have been upheld by courts in india and second if i challenge and i succeed what prevents india from coming back with another retrospective amendment so you know keeping these factors in mind and white industries had just taken place uh we decided that we will go the bit route now the question that arises is we did study uh the netherlands india treaty and we felt that fair and equitable clause expropriation clause did uh help vodafone to you know to succeed in this case and that's how we invoked now uh i i i have to say that there has been a lot of talk recently of sovereign power to tax yes there is a sovereign power to tax but i want to bring into focus what is the change that indian government has had from prior to 2007 8 and post 2007 to my mind when we opened up in 1991 we opened up the country for various reasons we were very keen to build our country into a foreign direct investment destination it was quite uh, it was very common at that time that you enter into bilateral investment treaties with other countries where 
you as uh, mr datar correctly said you subject certain powers to the treaty and say that i do have sovereign power to do x y z including tax but i will do it in a manner that i don't impinge upon the guarantees given to the foreign investor under the treaties according to me there is a change after 2007 8 in our political thinking i think in somewhere in 2006 7 after that when i met a lot of bureaucrats politicians the thought process changed to india is a big market and therefore we can do what we are doing and every foreign direct investor will come here pay retrospective amendment or any amendment that we say and or you know bring about any laws because they can't afford to overlook the indian market i think that's been the change and that's why we suddenly see from 2007 onwards uh, you know the there is the indian government the indian tax office is extremely belligerent in the way they go about their affairs now i would also like to address what mr datar said that you know when two countries come together to uh, sign a, a, a treaty they are somewhat subjecting their sovereign powers in every sphere now i would give a very easy example of international court of justice look at the jadhav case jadhav is somebody which pakistan is trying through their internal mechanics after all they could can also turn around and say oh i may have signed the treaty doesn't matter but my law permits me to try him under a military court martial now you know what is the answer the international court of justice which has got jurisdiction because there is a treaty signed by countries you 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 agree that a third party will look into certain aspects which you have undertaken in the treaty similarly you know tax measures is something that india agreed till a particular time now i understand i absolutely understand why india wants to retain taxing power and not subject it to a treaty you have a budget in the budget you have you have to create revenues so that you can meet you know all the social and economic uh, duties that a government is bound to have so you need that but i think that's required by every country we do not see many developed countries having so much uh, you know issue on allowing in a in an international treaty allowing uh, tax measures to come in now see what india has done their recent model treaty now says not only tax measures but execution of the tax measures will also not be you know part of an international treaty now united states of america yes has said that you know you can't make a tax measure a uh, part of an international bilateral investment treaty but they say that the way we are trying to enforce if that leads to expropriation definitely that will be subject to uh, the obligation under the treaty of expropriation but india in its model treaty and you know uh, its treaties with the recent countries that it has signed uh, I, i must also say that you know in 9 in uh, 2000 13 or 14 when uh, jet airways wanted uh, uh, you know 
to go to UAE and get some monies to sustain there. UAE told at that time the then finance minister, there is no way we will allow an investment to come into India without a BIT. So, you know, countries which are more powerful, which have the, which are the destinations where the money is, which you want to come into India, do ensure that bilateral investment treaties are signed. Now, I also would like to say that fair and equitable treatment, uh, Mr. Rajput mentioned, uh, you know, that, that, uh, there's that mostly uh, the issues of legitimate expectation. According to me, there is much more to fair and equitable treatment. And that is good faith, due process, unjust enrichment, unjust way of treating uh, a foreigner. Please look at, at this stage, please look at what happened in Vodafone case, which is in public domain. So. You have never taxed, and your Section 9 does not contain a provision that if there is change of hands outside India by which the control changes within India, you can tax that transaction. Now, it had never happened. And you have a Supreme Court of India, your Apex Court, saying, yes, such a transaction is not taxable. Because you don't have it. You don't have such a law. So bring in a law. But unfortunately, what do we do? We go back and start opening uh, closed transactions. Now, to my mind, it didn't stop here. I don't know. It's in public domain that several committees were formed by India because there was a lot of hue and cry in the, uh, you know, in the international investor for us that this rule of law you know that has been shaken is is really making us think whether we want now to invest in india or do we look for other countries which are more stable in their legal environment at that stage these committees particularly there was a committee headed by mr shom shom committee clearly held that this is not a clarificatory amendment. You are bringing about a new tax levy, which is very unfair, particularly to Vodafone, whose tax it is not, because Vodafone was not the, the entity which made a gain. So there were other committees set up by the government it also happened that just Mr. Arun Jaitley, I mean, I thought in 2014 when they presented the budget, that was the best time to undo this retrospective amendment. But Mr. Jaitley did say at that stage that if whatever these tribunals will hold, we will go by that, which unfortunately today, uh, you know, is is not being adhered to. And it's not that the government of India doesn't have a right to challenge. Of course, like every other litigant has a right to challenge an award. But the point is there's a history to this uh, particular dispute. And therefore, it would have been probably the best time to you know close this issue, but so be it. And I would in the end only say that sovereign power to tax is one thing. To enter into treaties where you say, I will exercise this power in a more, in a non-arbitrary fashion and do it in terms of what international law requires, I think you will get more foreign direct investment than the way you are doing today. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha. Uh, I can see how uh, passionate you are about the 
subject and uh, you know so all the you know many people tell me that i get very dramatic when i write my columns vodafone no full stop again vodafone but i can see the uh, passion in you has having represented vodafone so now we move on to an interesting uh, panel discussion which i am uh, looking forward to we have two uh, people joining us for panel discussion along with the people who spoke earlier we have dr rj r kashi bhatla who as i mentioned is a deputy legal advisor in the ministry of law and justice and in his capacity as a legal advisor he has tendered advice on important constitutional tax and international tax issues and was more importantly involved in drafting of the insolvency and bankruptcy code and the subsequent amendments to it he is also actively involved in bipa and bilateral investment treaty negotiations welcome sir uh, to the panel discussion we also have dr blasis kusniaki who is the deputy director strategic tax advice and dispute resolution with pricewaterhouse coopers in poland he is or he was an academic until recently now he is an academic tax practitioner and an attorney at law i owe a lot to blazes i take the liberty to call him by his first name because he has contributed to my treaties on general anti avoidance welcome blazes to efa india i know you have very active with efa in europe but welcome to the panel discussion so with that uh, let's move to uh, our questions and let's allow uh, people who have not spoken uh, to uh, talk about it uh, uh, blazes uh, fair and equitable treatment you heard the indian speakers now i know that you have lots of uh, other cases particularly the ucos case uh, the european food case of the european commission uh, i wanted you to focus on the cases abroad and more importantly do you see impact of these rulings on the indian policy i was just wondering if you can also touch base on what the uh, mr datar talked about uh, uh, mr chassis observation and more importantly the platform for collaboration of tax uh, which is now uh, a joint project or a toolkit by the imf oecd and un and world bank group of june 2020 which actually talks about taxation of offshore indirect transfers so i was just wondering if you in your opening you can cover these aspects Thank you very much, Mukesh. It's a real uh, privilege to to be with you uh, with this panel. Um, and the questions you 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 raise actually are very uh, interesting. Maybe we could ask Mr. Agarwal to turn off the microphone because it's it's. Uh, uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. So starting with fair and equitable treatment. I must admit that I uh, subscribe more to uh, Ms. Anrada uh, points that this is uh, way more than just about uh, legitimate expectations. It, it is, I think, a, a broad clause that we can call a safety net clause in the in terms of in the way that if something regarding over aggressive taxation, so to speak. does not uh, enter the ambit of other protection clauses under investment treaties like expropriation the prohibition of expropriation or discriminatory treatment then uh, investors may turn their attention to uh, fair and equitable treatment uh, clause because it is not only about legitimate expectation but also about good faith Uh, fair and transparent transparent proceedings and um, a certain quality of the legis legislation that we may expect in given uh, circumstances i think that this is uh, a lot about um, uh, to being treated by the host state in a way which is sufficiently transparent and predictable um from the perspective of the european court of justice um case law before i jump to yukos and other cases i i want i want to make a point which which might be interesting and uh, regards not only legal uh, certainty principle but also uh, the proportionality uh, if if we look at certain uh, cjeu um, cases like itercar or siat we we will see that um, failing with legal certainty by eu member states may not be sufficient to say that the uh, domestic tax law or domestic law 
uh, broadly speaking, of member state is um, contradictory to fundamental freedoms, like the free freedom to um, freedom of establishment of business activity in our member state. But what we can deduct from the case law is that if if legal certainty is so low that uh, investors cannot predict the outcomes, the tax, tax outcomes of their behavior, of their transactions, then what happens is also uh, the impossibility to uh, say whether or not the tax treatment is proportional. Because if something is so uncertain that we cannot uh, define its borders, we cannot also say if if something is proportional. So this is quite important under rule of law in, in, the, in the EU framework, that too less legal certainty means that it's impossible to state about proportionality. Uh, and in the end, the court will say that the law is in contradiction with the EU fundamental uh, freedoms. Um, and if we, if we look at, um, at the uh, taxation carve out, clauses in, in certain bilateral investment treaties um, and at the real re relevant uh, case law of uh, arbitral tribunals, then we will see that the sovereignty, uh, tax sovereignty, uh, is not absolute. It has its borders. And if uh, a country, let's say India or China, uh, implement and uh, enforce their tax law in order to target specific investors, uh, it, it means that such um, enforcement of tax law is not in good faith. It is actually in bad faith. Uh, it is arbitrary, uh, idiosyncratic, and so on and so forth. So even if we have um, taxation carve-out clauses, they are not absolute, and they, they end when the arbitrary and unfair treatment uh, begins. Um, and it is quite visible in the case mentioned by Mukesh and also by Arvind, uh, famous UK, UKOS versus Russia case being at the same time um, the biggest award case in the history of uh, investment arbitration uh, cases. Um, interesting thing with that case is that even before the final award was uh, ruled in 2014, we had... Um, the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights from 20 September 2011, in which the European Court of Human Rights uh, stated that in, in the UK's case, the domestic Russian tax authorities failed to strike a fair balance between the legitimate aim of these proceedings, the tax proceedings, and the measure employed. So what the European Court of Human Rights wants to say is that the enforcement of um, tax law by a given state uh, must strike the first balance between the needs and the expectations of the tax authorities to provide a state budget with sufficient uh, inflows of funds on the one side with the rights and freedoms of taxpayers on the other side. And one of that freedom was already mentioned by Anurada, which is the freedom to carry out business activity. And uh, doing so in, a, uh, in an effective way in, in a foreign country is impossible without sufficient degree of predictability. And if we look in, in the, in the uh, final observations of the uh, investment tribunal in the U arbitration tribunal in the UCOS case, um, then we will see that even though the tax authorities uh, base their decisions on, uh, on, on, on the doctrines that are known or should have been known by the investors, but the enforcement of such doctrines, in the UCOS case, it was bad faith uh, doctrine, uh, deviates from the uh, established practice, deviates from the uh, interpretation of tax law as proposed by the courts and the scholarship, then this is something that is in breach with the fair and equitable treatment. And particularly in the paragraph 625, the tribunal um, said that 
in the Russian context, it is clear to the tribunal that there was no precedent for reattribution of income at the time that the tax assessments and, and related decisions were issued in respect of Yukos. So in, in, in the Yukos case, the tax authorities, for the first time in the history of the Russian law, applied the so-called bad faith doctrine uh, in order to reattribute foreign income, income in the ownership of foreign investors to its respective uh, Russian, Russian investors. Uh, so it, it was unheard of before. As, as, as far as I know, the, the similar situation took place in both Karn and uh, Vodafone cases where uh, it was unheard of during the tax proceedings that um, the, the, the foreign transactions the transfer of uh, assets completely outside the territory of India could be taxed uh, under capital gain clause uh, uh, in, uh, in India. So I can see the clear parallel between the Yukos case outcome and, uh, and the Indian Vodafone and uh, current case. Uh, so this is, I think, um, uh, interesting to, to, to you know, be aware and, and final, to say a final word about European food uh, case versus European Commission of the Court of Justice from 18 June 2019. Um, it was actually, actually in, in very brief uh, case against uh, Romania and the Romanian um, uh, favorable tax treatment of foreign investors, which was, according to the European Commission, illegal state aid treatment. But it was uh, actually uh, implemented and enforced by the Romania several years before Romania acceded to European Union in 2009. Uh, uh, despite that, the European Commission felt uh, to, have, um, pre, uh, to have a right to, to say that state aid actually uh, took place and Romania cannot, under the legally binding arbitral hour decision, uh, enforce this decision because it would be the second state aid to, to paying the respective um, uh, compensation to the investors. And, and the court was clear that it is impossible for the European Commission to step in and to uh, break the outcome of the um, arbitral tribunal decision because it would be retrospective application of the EU Commission prerogatives and according to the subtle case law, uh, um, under fundamental freedoms and rule of law, which is common to all EU member states, law in principle cannot apply retrospectively. Law may only apply prospectively. And in, on, only in, in, in the very extreme situations for, for of, uh, public policy reasons, this rule that we call from Latino lex retro non agit may be uh, may be ignored but only in extremely exceptional situations thank you uh, dr blasis uh, uh, this is just a good point uh, or you know to invite uh, dr kasi bartla to share his perspectives just thought i will add that he is going to speak in his personal capacity and he is going to touch only on the policy issues rather than anything specific to Vodafone or Kane Arbitration Awards. Uh, sir, uh, you know, we wanted to have your perspective on India's position with respect to tax disputes. So the, the 2016 model has made it very clear that tax is not included. But I think there is an air of uncertainty whether prior to 2016 model taxes is included or not. In particular, you know, can of tax policy, which is a sovereign right, and as everyone mentioned, and also in a way represents the will of the citizens, because the elected representatives of member of parliament uh, are passing that particular law, be subjected to questioning under a BIPA uh, or a BIT award, because that's what is the view that comes based on my discussions with your colleagues in the government. And hence, the question was, and to some extent, this is academic, because India is already challenged the Vodafone award, would India challenge the award uh, and the recourse that is available to India? Uh, what would India do with res respect to Kane, if you can share with us, particularly since uh, in the Kane award, uh, the 
arbitral uh, tribunal has suggested that damages be recovered uh, from the uh, investor state. And more importantly, can these awards lead to any more changes in India's policy with respect to BITs or for that matter, change in tax policy? Your perspective, sir. So you are on mute, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, respected Honorable Justice Mr. Patnaik and uh, Dr. Aniruddha and uh, Dr. Dhatar, Ms. Anuradha and uh, Isha and Mr. Bhutani. It's a great pleasure and privilege and uh, I feel it is a great honor for being with all of you and sharing this platform. Uh, and I'm thankful to IFA for affording me this opportunity. Though I am a little toddler when compared to eminent luminaries, legal luminaries like uh, Aniruddha Anuradha and Anirudh and uh, Mr. Dhatar and Justice Patnaik. I'm venturing to share my views or thoughts, which as I already mentioned, will be purely personal in no way reflects either my department or my government. To start with, I would like to share a quote from Kautilya's Ardhashastra relating to taxation. I quote from Kautilya's Ardhashastra, taxation should not be painful, process for the people. There should be lenience and collection while dealing, deciding the tax structure. Ideally, government should collect the taxes like a honeybee, which sucks just the right amount of the honey from the flower so that both, the, uh, both uh, can survive. Taxes should not be collected in small and not in large proportions. I unquote from Ardhashastra. This clearly relates to the process of collection of taxation. Now, coming to the uh, core issue of the power to control taxes is a cornerstone in the exercise of full sovereignty of states. Tax avoidance in an uh, underdeveloped or developing upon economy should not be encouraged for practical as well as ideological grounds. Taxes are the price of civilization and one would like to pay the price to buy civilization. My personal concern is that legitimate tax planning within the framework of law is permissible and colorable devices cannot be part of tax planning and is uh, wrong to encourage or entertain the belief that it is honorable to avoid the payment of tax by uh, resorting to dubious methods and tax can be levied only through a legislative action. So it, as far as uh, Indian law is concerned, the fundamental constitutional principle is that no tax can be levied without an authority of law. Uh, perhaps that might be the reason for uh, bringing out the uh, retroactive or retrospective amendments to the taxation by Finance Act 2012. I'm not going into the merits or demerits of these amendments or the wisdom of the appropriate government uh, for taking such a decision at the uh, appropriate time. But the core concern is whether the bilateral investment uh, promotion and protection agreements or the bilateral investment treaties that do exist prior to 2012 do have an explicit provision in the investment treaty considered for consideration of the tax claims or the tax measures. That is a core issue to be uh, addressed or core issue to be answered. If we peruse the pre-revised model tax that existed prior to 2016, which is on the basis of a draft, model draft that was approved by the cabinet as a measure of economic reforms in the country on the basis of which India negotiated and signed more than 84 bilateral investment agreements with different jurisdictions. A, a perusal of this particular draft it clearly reveals that there is no explicit provision in the bilateral investment treaties accepting the covering of tax measures under the uh, bilateral investment uh, agreements. Per contra, it says that uh, uh, no tax measure can be raised and it has to be covered appropriately under the double taxation avoidance agreements. There's a clear stipulation in the agreements. So therefore, it to my little knowledge and understanding of the bilateral investment treaties, what India had signed uh, with different uh, jurisdictions, and of course, some of them are uh, terminated recently, uh, whose preliminary tenure is come. 
completed. So therefore, in such circumstances, taking any uh, an inference that tax measures are covered under the bilateral investment treaties that India signed, including the one which is in question or in debate, that is India and Netherlands, uh, may not be a correct proposition that, yes, it covers all the tax measures. It, per contrary, it clearly says that uh, it, it is uh, specifically need to be dwelt upon under the bilateral investment uh, agreements or bilateral investment, bil sorry, uh, income, double taxation avoidance agreements and not under the bilateral investment treaties. For example, if we argue, if we consider the argument that it specifically or explicitly covers tax measures, then the sec second question that may arise is then what is the need, what is the sanctity of having a double taxation avoidance agreement if every tax measure is covered under the bilateral investment uh, treaties what India had signed uh, prior to 2016. So the I it's very difficult and I may not agree to the argument. Maybe I, my, my perception may be wrong, but uh, it's my perception that the bilateral investment treaties, the, which are signed on the basis of the 2000 uh, prior to 2016 draft, that is on the basis of the 1994 draft, has an explicit provision uh, for covering tax measures uh, under the uh, relevant treaties. Uh, at the same time, treaties are to be interpreted in good faith and it cannot be interpreted according to uh, 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 opportunity of any particular case or any particular uh, uh, incident. So therefore, since there is no explicit provision in the treaties what India signed earlier, it may not be correct to draw an inference that there is an existence of uh, tax measures under the bilateral investment treaties what India uh, signed. And coming to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, in investment agreements treaties, uh, it is uh, proper to submit that there are several bilateral investment treaties across the globe which have been signed by different jurisdictions do contain um, uh, exceptions to taxation, say in the form of MFN or in the form of a India. It is a fact that, and it is uh, uh, correct to say that yes, India had uh, is having a car vote. Uh, in, in, in its revised model draft of 2016 uh, to exclude taxation and tax measures. And uh, there is no uh, uh, doubt about that. It has been done with an intent to uh, exclude the tax measures as it, India has arguing all these years on the basis of the earlier drafts, what they had or earlier agreements, what they signed. Uh, and this is not in gross violation of any international practice or international uh, standards. There are countries where the tax exemptions have been made in their bilateral investment treaties or bilateral investment agreements, whatever the nomenclature there may be. And these exceptions are in some of them are in the form of a specific exemption. Some of them are in the form of a, a limited exemption. But it is a fact and it is uh, an admitted legal position that yes, the bilateral investments that exist in other jurisdictions do have a, a clear uh, exemption in the uh, model what they had. Why? Because uh, it's a certain law, the tribunals, especially I rely upon the Encana versus Equada, where the tribunal held that in the absence of a specific commitment from the host state, the foreign investors have has neither the right nor any legitimate expectation that the tax regime will not change perhaps to its disadvantage during the period of investment. It is very difficult for any sovereign power to ensure or assure any investor, whomso he may be, that they will not change the tax regime during the investment, uh, during the period of their investment. It's a well settled law. So therefore, the argument that no sovereign state cannot be make a retroactive or retrospective amendment may not be correct in that legal uh, sense. I'm not supporting or accepting uh, or de declining the arguments put forward by the learned distinguished luminaries. But the point here is not having uh, power is not permissible across the uh, globe because it is very clearly settled by the tribunals that you can have it. And unless you make a commitment, you cannot claim it as a matter of right or you cannot claim it as a legitimate expectation. And India has a very strong, long history of retroactive or retrospective amendments. If you peruse the history from 1921 uh, to the present text, there are uh, various amendments which have been made with retrospective effect. Of course, 
I'm again not going into the merits of these retroactive uh, amendments. Or neither I'm supporting the retroactive uh, amendment, nor I'm uh, differing with that because it is a policy decision of the government which has been taken in the <coughs> past. But this practice is there all over the world. It is not a new practice uh, in bringing retroactive or retrospective amendments. For example, UK has an history of retrospective amendments. US has a history of retrospective <coughs> amendments. I rightly fully agree with with the uh, what Professor uh, Blaze has said that yes, uh, the it's subject to the proportionality test or subject to the public policy test. So in case if any retroactive amendment <coughs> is against the public policy or is against the proportionality principle, they are open to the challenge. There are incidences where the apex court struck down the retroactive retrospective amendments in, in India. Uh, therefore, I fully agree, support that having a tax car vote is a well-reasoned decision taken while finalizing the model draft of 2016, and which is not a deviation from the <coughs> international practice. It is in accordance with the international practice. And now, at the same time, extraneous economic situations may warrant an extraneous uh, uh, legal positions. The law cannot remain in static. As new situations arise, new law has to be evolved. Maybe in due course, there may be a, a possibility or may not be a possibility of bringing new laws to address the concerns or address the situation. With these few words, I stop here. And if there are any questions, I'll be. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Kasibata, for your views. Uh, I just am mindful of the time. Uh, I just wanted to consolidate uh, some questions. Uh, uh, I wanted if uh, Doctor Rajput can come in because some questions have fallen for him. Uh, Dr. Rajput, uh, you alluded on the fact that the argument of breaching legitimate expectation could have been argued by the Indian government because there is no express legal promise that the government made under the BIT. Uh, you know, one of the participants wanted you to elaborate uh, on that. Uh, my other question is, do you see the rulings in Kane and Vodafone uh, being a cautionary tale against retrospective taxation, particularly the ones that impact uh, foreign investors. And uh, Dr. Kashibata made uh, a very passionate, uh, you know, support for the BIT uh, and the fact that retrospective amendment is there in other countries as well. We were just wondering if you can share your perspectives before yes. I hand it over to uh, Honorable Justice Patnaik. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. And it was very interesting to listen to all the speakers, but uh, I can't miss one point. I've been thinking of these issues for more than 10 years and uh, having appeared on and advised investors as well as states. I think on these issues, uh, views can be taken on sides, but one has to at times go back to the law, which is text, context, object, purpose, and, and rules of treaty interpretation. But that besides, I just want to make a brief clarification. I never meant to say that legitimate expectation is the only content of fair and equitable treatment standard. It seems that's the misimpression which some of the other speakers or even the audience must have, have caught. Now, what is the scope of legitimate expectations? Let's understand that legitimate expectations now is the core of fair and equitable treatment and one of the most important standards. The way the jurisprudence has developed and as it stands today, Say 10 years back, it was different and it is drastically changed now. Still, there are some arbitrators who adhere to the older jurisprudence. But the newer trend is that there can be no legitimate expectations unless there is a clear assurance. And this clear assurance from the state could be either express or implied. Express is where a state specifically says that I'm going to give you tax breaks. And there was, for example, uh, last year, there was a case brought against Italy in the renewable energy sector where the foreign investor was saying that you promised to give me some concessions and you have removed those tax concessions. So and then the tribunal found them to be in the breach. Now, here is a case where there was an express promise to, to give a tax concession. And this often happens in case of tax breaks. And that's really for some of the states who are really keen to attract investments. 
I think India has gone a step above than than what it was, say, 15 years back, where it was desperate. Now the world is watching. The only place where things can grow is probably Asia, and there's very reason why they want to come here. That doesn't mean India has to has to be aggressive on that. But as I said, legitimate expectations could arise also from the context, and that context could be a set of statements which are made by the government. Of course, you look at the legal framework. But when you look at the legal framework, you can't assume the legal framework to be frozen. And therefore, what is a way which most tribunals have found is whether an investor conducted a due diligence before entering. So, if you conduct a due diligence, and if you look at the taxing regime and say, "Well, this is where the situation is. This is what a jurisdiction is amenable to," um, there might be issues of retrospective taxation as well, because even UK, US, many other so-called Developed countries who are now trying to call themselves not so developed and call India developed, even these so-called developed countries also follow the same uh, retrospective regime. But I think we still feel somehow that we are inferior, and what they are doing is the best. But the world is changing. That's where the world stands. States do tend to do these things. But if there is a promise, if that amounts to a legitimate expectation, then a state cannot withdraw from that promise. But an associated point is of estoppel. And estoppel is a general principle of international law. So it's quite possible to say that you state behaved in a certain manner, gave me a promise, I acted on that behalf, I came into your jurisdiction. Now you are unreasonably withdrawing from that promise. I'm suffering the losses. You have to face the consequences. So that's also quite, quite, quite possibly a way in. So we, so that's how how legitimate expectations is going to function in in these specific contexts. Just one point I really couldn't resist, and and I think I can take that liberty. Being uh, Dr. Kuzniaki, being a former academic, uh, we have to be very careful with the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union, and more careful of the jurisprudence of of the European Court of Justice, because European system, according to European Court of Justice and uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, is a unique system. The Cardi system, uh, the Cardi judgment, is now being criticised, but. Uh, just for us to ponder in the future, Acmea is creating a lot of troubles for the world of foreign investment all over the world. But I'll stop there. Uh, Blasis, uh, would you like to uh, rebut uh, Dr. Rajput on the uh, EU decision? Yes, that, very briefly. Um, it is, of course, correct to say that the European Union has a unique system which was, for some reason, not very likable, for example, by the UK government some time ago, and therefore we have no UK um, in the European Union anymore. But I pointed uh, to the fundamental elements of rule of law, which is, I think, um, common to all countries around the world and all members of the United Nations, like the legal uh, legal certainty and legal proportion and the proportionality of the measures taken by the tax authorities in order to uh, achieve certain uh, aims, uh, and, and that, therefore I just pointed to it, because we, we were mentioning legal certainty, um, which is very much correct and apt to, to mention this principle if we talk about Vodafone and current cases, and I just wanted to make this thought-provoking um, observation that if, if, if the lack of legal certainty is quite blatant, then we cannot say that certain tax measures are proportionate. If we cannot say so, then arguments about uh, prevention of uh, tax avoidance, prevention of treaty shopping, round tripping, will uh, actually uh, not be very strong because how we can decide whether the retrospective taxation by India, Australia, Canada, US or other jurisdictions was in fact correct measure to eliminate treaty shopping, to eliminate tax avoidance. If there is so much legal certainty, we cannot state about legal, uh, we cannot state about the proportionality of the retroactive uh, taxation. And if so, it is easier for arbitrators in, in the tribunals to say that um, a retroactive taxation was in breach of fair and equitable treatment. If, on the other hand, um, certain states like India, China, Australia, or others um, make it very explicit that the, the uh, principal purpose of retroactive taxation is to eliminate egregious tax avoidance with the use of other jurisdictions, 
And in our um, view, the only way to do it effectively is to do it retroactively, because if we do it prospectively, uh, uh, foreign investors will make some tweaks, uh, some reorganizations, and the tax avoidance uh, practice will uh, continue. And this is not that our tax policy um, may accept. So that, that therefore I, I mentioned the, the, the proportionality principle under ECJ. But I of course agree that this is a separate legal regime and we use it by analogy with careful, very careful approach. Thank you. Uh, Mitesh, uh, just one second. A lot, go ahead, a lot has been said that all over the world there have been retrospective amendments, including in India. So let me just clarify that. I have studied this in quite detail. And of course, I'm ready to be corrected. India has never done a retrospective amendment to bring a new tax levy. Never. It's all been when two high courts have fought or Supreme Court is coming with an interpretation where tax has been collected. Nowhere in the world have been there, there have been retrospective amendments to bring a new tax levy. England, Australia. In Australia, they brought an amendment. They grandfathered the judgment of their apex court. In England, there were schemes, there was a fraud, and that's how it happened. Therefore, no country has brought a new tax levy for the first time. Yeah, just very short follow-up. And this is about proportionality. So you make implement retroactive taxation, but in a proportional way, which means that you don't use it to target specific foreign investors but you use it to eliminate certain phenomenon which is not acceptable by international fora, such as in Australia, artificial uh, schemes, which were, by the way, illegal and connected with criminal activity. If we have such uh, you know, blatant breach of tax policy, then I think it is proportionate, proportionate and therefore nobody will win in front of the arbitral tribunal the case based on the notion of the breach of fair and equitable treatment and on the contrary in the Vodafone and Kern case we did not have this explicit statement of the Indian government that they want to eliminate artificial schemes at least I don't know about it but if this is incorrect please correct me. Thank you Mr. Datar very quick comments before I hand over to Honorable Justice Patnaik for the final word. Uh, yes, I wanted to mention that <clears throat> uh, in the context of what Kashi Bhatta said, uh, yes, nobody disputes our sovereign right to tax and that, but I must mention that it is well settled throughout international law, as I understand, that the FET clause includes taxation measures, include any kind of measures. So to say that taxation measures would be out of this purview may not be fully correct. And uh, I would al also uh, ask him to reconsider that if we have excluded taxation, then why isn't anybody else signed this treaty except Belize? We'll have to really think about that also. That's the two points I wanted to make. And just to supplement what Anuradha said, I did some research and I must tell you that we've had more retrospective amendments as a country than all the other countries put together. Thank you, Mr. Datar. Uh, I now hand it over uh, to Honorable Justice Patnaik. Uh, welcome, sir, once again. Uh, one of the aspects that uh, did not get discussed uh, was the enforceability of award. Uh, one concern that uh, people have in general on foreign awards, nothing to do with Kane or Vodafone, is the enforceability of foreign awards because uh, it is subject to public policy in India and to some extent uh, with uh, no disrespect meant for the highest institution in the country, the Supreme Court, has been a bit inconsistent on what is actually public policy for India, particularly if you look at the judgments just in this particular year in 2020. So that was one aspect. The other aspect was a point was made by Dr. Rajput on estoppel. Uh, my understanding was that there can be no estoppel when it comes to tax matters. I don't know. I am not a constitutional lawyer, but I just thought I will make a mention of that. But with that comments, over to you, Justice Patnai. Thank you, Mukesh. Um, I was extremely happy to learn a lot of things that were discussed. In fact, I accepted Mr. Mukesh Bhutan's invitation participate in this function 
because I wanted to understand this Vodafone and Pay Now. They are not available in the public domain. And uh, I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Rajput, Ms. Anurag Dutta, Mr. Arun Dutta, Dr. Brazil Iznaski, and Dr. Khasiwata on the subject. Now, I will not be able to speak on the, you know, international treaty awards and all that because I am not handling those matters. I not been studying them. But I will speak from the point of view of a student of constitution. Mr. Dattar did speak of my revision of the interpreter statute by GPC. Perhaps he does not know I have also revised DT Boshu Shorter Cost of India, the latest one. Both published by Lexis and Lexis. And therefore, I am a very keen student of constitutional law, as also a very keen student of interpretation of statutes. And you've heard Fouquet's Pitale telling me that I am an arbitrator. As an arbitrator, not only in domestic uh, arbitrations, but also in international arbitrations, I have one approach be fair and equitable to both the parties, all the parties who are arbitrating with me. That is the basic you know, spirit of an arbitrator. And there is also the provision the, in the Arbitration Act, and that is the approach that I have in an arbitrator. So I will speak to you from the constitutional element. I will speak to you from the point of view of factory interpretation. And I will also speak to you as an arbitrator, as a fair arbitrator. Now, interestingly, I was on Supreme Court when the judgment in Buddha for the case was delivered on January 20th of 2012 by Justice Kapadia, this is another question, and Justice Supreme And soon after the judgment was delivered, it looked as if Justice Kapadia was waiting to bring me to his bench. Justice Alaya Krishnan was out, and I was brought into the bench of the uh, presiding Chief Justice then, Justice Kapadia, to listen to tax matters basically. And I remember when the Vodafone of judgment was delivered, and there was a lot of hue and cry in India not by international forum, not by the international investors, but criticism of the judgment. Because it was going to lead a lot to loss of revenue. And criticizing, in a way, this is Kapadia, for I'm not talking about that. I was not there just as other Krishna, because other Krishna had moved out to a different church. And once I went, entered the chamber of Justice Kapadi, who was then the chief of India, his eyes were full of tears. I said, sir, what has happened to you? Why are tears? Look at the way people are criticizing my judgment. Have I done anything wrong? I said, sir, you are the chief justice of India. You are an independent judge. You have decided the matter. Right. That's all. Why are you so shaken? No, no. Judges are also shaken when the judgments are criticized. Right. And then he asked me, what do you think my colleagues must be thinking about me? That's nothing wrong. Nothing bad. What do you think? Sir, I have a judgment. The judgment is a good judgment. A fair judgment. A proper judgment. And you have done your duty as a judge. Come in everything else. Don't be pressurized by criticism. You have written the judgment, you have written the judgment. That's all. I'm telling you from the judge's point of view. Right? And then I read the judgment, I found the judgment was correct. 
Then it so happened. You see, one of the most important principles of constitutional law in India uh, has adopted is separation of powers. It is for parliament to make the law, stateless to make the law, and it is for judges, the high courts and Supreme Court, to deliver judgments. So, what the law is ultimately is what the judges say. Right. This is the principle of separation of powers. The lawmaker cannot take the role of interpreting the law. The judges will interpret the law. And judges who write to who deliver the judgments in accordance with the laws and the laws. This is what the system is we have in India. So much so that where judgments have been delivered by the high courts or, the, or by the Supreme Court, and the state legislature or parliament has tried to undo the judgments. The courts have struck down those, judgments, those uh, laws, saying this judgment is in violation of the principle of separation of powers and is a teeth in the judgment of the Supreme Court on the High Court. The only exception was if the basis on which the judgment was made, provisions. If that basis is changed by parliament, that can be done. So first you must change the basis, right? But you can't legislate to undo a judgment. And then you can say, like in this case, what they have done? They have put explanation 4 and explanation 5 in section 9, 1, and clarified the judgment. So they have removed the basis by saying, we now we have issued the clarification. 9 1 has to interpret it and the context of the explanation. Right? Two explanations have been added. This is what they have done it. And they have done it since 1962. Retrospective effect. Right? Now, what therefore they have done is they have violated the principle of separation of powers and they have tried to get over the law. That Supreme Court laid down a principle of separation of powers by removing the basis and by adding two explanations, four and five, in section nine one, yeah. and say no, this is what was intended, not what the Supreme Court said intended. My question is: Is this fair? Is this proper? When our system, the power belongs to. The judges to interpret what the law was. Why did you take up the role, role of interpreting and clarifying right from rights to this the future? There were compulsions. At that time, I thought what the government was doing not correct. The compulsions because it was going to lead a lot of refund. Right? And government was going to lose revenue. Mr. Pranab Mukherjee was then the finance minister. He was bent upon doing it because there was a pressure from the income department. We need revenue. If this much is refunded or this much is not collected, we'll be in trouble. And therefore, some financial compulsions were necessary for these amendments to come in with retrospective. And there were also political compulsions. Why? Because of criticism, public criticism. That you must do it. You must do it. And that is our important. Right. But my approach is the judges must have a longer and a wider and a broad vision of things. Constitution member of India or any constitution is not made for a few years. It is an organic instrument made for hundreds and hundreds of years and it has to be interpreted in a dynamic way. Right? So, the judges interpreted it but parliament thought no. No matter what happens in international investments, right? We must change it. Why? Our immediate need is pressure of revenue. That is another important thing. Now, as you know, they made a retrospective amendment. And uh, 
We know that we have to lay down by the Constitution Bench, as far back as 1958, MP Sundarmaya and Co. versus State of AP and others. It was sales tax amendment, set up amendment challenge. And the Supreme Court said that the power conferred on sovereign legislature carries with it the authority to enact the law either prospectively or retrospectively. Unless there can be found in the Constitution itself a limitation on that power. Right? Presently, the limitation on that power is there in Article 21 of the Constitution. 20 in bracket 1. It says you can't make a retrospective law and punish a person. Right? First to declare a punishment by law and then only if a person commits that offence, after the royal declared that this is an offence, you can punish. You can uh, punish. Otherwise not. You can try and punish. This is the only provision, Article 21 of the Constitution, right, which prohibits retroactive criminal law. Right. But my question now is, what about Article 265 of the Constitution? Article 265 of the Constitution says, subject to the Constitution, no tax shall be levied or collected except by authority. So therefore, who will declare the law? Judges will declare the law. So as Ms. Arona was saying, how can you live a new law, a new tax law? The law must be laid down to live your collect tax at the time you want to collect. And it is for the Supreme Court to interpret it. How can you live it? Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has been holding since 1958 power this is what you call parliament and the state list have the power to make it for you know tax in England parliament is sovereign there is no written constitution there is no limitations in India parliament is not sovereign why there is a written constitution and article 245 of the Constitution says, let me read it. This you must bear in mind. It says, subject to the provision of this Constitution, Parliament may make laws for the whole or any part of the territory of India, which will include the income tax laws. Right? And the legislature of a state may make laws for the whole or any part of the state. And then 246 laid down the division of powers. This one, parliament has the powers. This two, state has exclusive powers. This three, concurrent powers. And resident powers, 248 says parliament has powers. So parliament has powers, but subject to the provisions of the constitution. Right. And Article 265 is one of these points of the Constitution subject to which Parliament has power? If Article 265 very clearly says that no tax shall be levied or collected except by authority of law, the authority of law must be there when you are living and collecting it. If it is not there, it is not there. That's all. Thereafter, you can't make a law retrospectively and say it will have an effect from 1962. In my view, the Supreme Court now should wake up and review this question. The five judges who laid down this. Right? And we are all bound by it. And now 141. The Supreme Court should wake up and then open up earlier. In AK Gopalan case, Supreme Court said in Article 21, 
the procedure established by law means procedure established by statutory law. So the statutory law says a particular procedure, that procedure only has to be followed. This was reversed in Manega Gandhi case. It says no, not merely statutory procedure established by law means due process of law. The American concept. Right. Due process of law will involve natural principle, principle of natural justice. So, you please appreciate that time has come when the Supreme Court has to have a deal at these judgments which speaks over. But that is the culprit. That retrospective power of parliament or the state legislature make a law in respect to uh, or taxation is the culprit of the whole, whole dispute that is going on. If the Supreme, the Supreme Court wakes up and says, larger man takes a view, sorry, in view of Article 265, no such law can be made retrospectively in taxation matters and in criminal matters. And this is consistent with the principle of statutory interpretation. Principle of statutory interpretation says, Penal laws have to be strictly construed. Why? It has got very serious consequences for the citizen or for the subject. Taxation law has to be serious and strictly construed. Literal meaning has to be taken into consideration. Why? Because after 265, without authority of law, nothing can be collected. So, Supreme Court should back up. And it is not as if the Supreme Court has not reviewed it earlier than this. Let me tell you, for an, I gave the example of the AK Gopal case. Now, in Uli Krishnan case, a smaller bench, I think it was a three judge bench, which held that uh, education, there cannot be a fundamental right to impart it. Education is the function of the state. TFI said, no, 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 let us change the concept. Why? Because there were no investment coming forward, not enough colleges and schools. Right. There must be some private education because that recognition that was given by the state to earlier education institution, they said it was a, it was an education institution comes from the agency of the state. They changed the concept, whole concept in TFI 11 judges bench, they review it. And they said, sorry, education, right, to impart education can be an occupation under Article 19.1 G of the Constitution. And therefore, any private person, a private corporate, a private entity, can impart education, right, as a fundamental right under Article 19.1 G. So, law can be changed. And law has been changing. You look at the Jindal judgment with regard to interstate uh, trade and commerce. Reversed by the Supreme Court, by a larger bench of 10 or 11 judges. The earlier judgment was by the Sikapadia. Jindal still is. Still is still. Right. So the Supreme Court has now to take a broader view. Of course, the legislature to do it is very difficult. They have got options. They have got compulsions. But since the power of parliament and power of state list is subject to the constitution, and view of Article 265 and view of Article 245, which is subject to the constitution, right? Parliament can make law with regard to the of India, and states can do the state legislature. The subject to provision will also include Article 265 in the Constitution. This approach must change of the Supreme Court. And when they lay down the law, that will be the law of the land. I remember, then it becomes more difficult for constitutional amendment. I remember, if you all remember, I delivered the Lily Thomas judgment. Famous Lily Thomas. Only two judges. I was the author of the judgment. You say a politician, a, an MLA, or a parliamentarian, once convicted and gets disqualified in the political act, right? He gets out from the parliament and gets out. He cannot find an appeal and continue. Section 8.4 of the Reputation Act, 4A, that I struck down. 
and I said that we can have it will have prospective effect, not retrospective effect. To say to save some legislatures, uh, some governments money. We don't know how many were committed, how many, how many MLAs or how many MPs. We did not get the statistics. It will have prospective. Right. Nalu got affected, Nalu Yadav got affected really badly. Many other political leaders got affected, Jalita got affected. Out means out. Some could lay down the law. Parliament did make an attempt to reverse it. Did they succeed? They did not succeed. Right? Because there were some political problems, the BJP backed out, they could not succeed. The Senate Select Committee. Then they made an ordinance. They made no sense because some political leaders had to be saved. There were pressures like Mr. Lalu Yadav. They had to be continued in Parliament. They made no sense. Pranam Mukherjee said, I can't. I can't say it's ordinance because the Supreme Court has said, Parliament has no power to make this kind of a law. How can the President have the power to make an ordinance? Lawmaking powers are of the Parliament are only exceeded by the President. I did my research and I found out an article from Howard Law Review and applied it. And my principle was the sadistic tax was really in the nature of a penalty. Because he had first filed the return, give you a loss return of uh, 10 lakhs. Later on, he made a retrospective law, right, and said, particulars have gone wrong. Then you have to pay tax on it, and she tax on it. Right. And later on, after you had done the job, after you had done the act, you are trying to penalize it for what you eight lakhs tax. No, uh, tax on eight lakhs. Right. As additional tax. He said, you first declare the law. A penal provision, I said, has to be declared first. Otherwise, it will not stand the test of law. I developed it. And I remember an additional attorney general had come, he was from Goa. He argued before me. This was challenged before the division bench. And then it was examined by the government and said, This is what like you seem to be correct. And they deleted that provision from the income tax. Right. Some, some thinking has to be done by the Supreme Court. Government is under pressure. Political leaders are under pressure. All kinds of compulsions. Right. But some thinking has to be done by the Supreme Court of India and change that law, that taxation, and we impose retrospectively. Just as penal law can be made retrospectively, taxation law cannot be made. If that is, and you can't say it will apply only to foreign investors, it will be hit by Article 14, discrimination, equality, right? So it will be hit by Article 14 straight away, it will be a discriminatory law. You have to make one law and you have to say, so far as taxation is concerned, right, if there is judgment of the Supreme Court, you can't undo that judgment. They have interpreted it, right. So Article 265 has to be interpreted. Once Article 265 is taken into consideration, you can't make a record. This is my point. This is the point I was trying to make. I think let us see if there are some jurists in the Supreme Court who come and have this view 
and uh, approach. And uh, the U.S. this Mukesh asked for an enforcement award. Right. You see, a foreign award is challenged. If you look at Singapore or I've been doing international operations. If there is a Singapore award, right, CIK award, then challenge Singapore. First stage. Right. It has to be tested on the basis of law that is there, from law there, there, and of course the applicable law to the arbitration dispute. Second stage is when it comes to execution in India. Right. They will see whether the fundamental law of this country has been violated before the enforcement. These are two stages. If you look at the Arbitration Act, right. Now, this law regarding public policy is in a very nebulous state, not yet developed. Gradually and gradually it will develop. There are only few judgments of its own. But eventually it will develop. And what is fundamental policy, what is not fundamental policy, we'll have to lay it down. Right, they are all made. The one few judgments is just Thakur and some other in the mercy, but it has to develop. And regarding Estopol, yes, Mr. Mutani was saying that yes, Estopol does not really. Earlier, they applied MP sugar mills. This is Bhagavati laid down the law of uh, you know, what you call promissory Estopol. Before that, also there was a judgment in 1967, I will have or something. Promissory Estopol. Promissory Estoppel principles develop. Right. But gradually and gradually, the Supreme Court later on diluted it and said, right, necessities of policy may dictate the government to reverse it. And the government can show and with, with materials that reversal of that uh, promise was necessary in the public interest that can be permitted by courts. And court will not enforce the promissory Estoppel. This is the question. I must say thank you, thank you very much for having me this opportunity and it was a very good discussion. I learned a lot and I got an opportunity to throw some ideas which can be, which can be taken up by like Mr. Datta and by uh, Anirudha and all of the lawyers that is in Supreme Court to change the thinking of the Supreme Court so that there is more certainty in the brain and interest in respect in my reporting, even domestically. There has to be certain. There has to be certain law if you have to award to call bring in investment and yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Thank you for your words of uh, wisdom. Uh, I think we are coming to the close. Uh, I think I would be doing a disservice by not mentioning names of three of my colleagues who put this uh, show together: uh, Dira Jain, uh, Ishita, and uh, Joseph Anthony. Uh, with this, uh, over to you, Neeraj, uh, to close the session and thank everyone. Neeraj, are you there? Uh, you're still on mute. Or Ishita, would you like to uh, chime in? Uh, yeah, my, my apologies, actually, uh, I was on mute. Uh, uh, thank you, th thank you, Mukesh, uh, uh, and good evening, friends. In fact, uh, it has been uh, such a wonderful evening, uh, in fact, and there could not have been a better uh, way to begin uh, the new year. The stimulating uh, deliberations uh, by the luminaries uh, have left us uh, completely spellbound. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 we, we, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we abundantly thank uh, Dr. Am uh, Honorable Justice Patnaik for accepting uh, our invitation and enlightening us on, 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 the, on the subject. I thank uh, Dr. Datar, uh, who has always been supportive to IFA, and we extremely benefited from his uh, deliberations. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Kashi Bhatla for accepting our invitation at the last moment and presenting his views on the topic. Uh, 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 and Dr. Uh, uh, I thank Ms. Mrs. Uh, Antaradat, Dr. Blazes, uh, uh, Arvind Rajput, Dr. Rajput, 